Hey y'all, welcome to the Closet Recording Studio. I'm going to try something a little different this time um, to put on our audiobook channel. I'm going to read an audiobook, but I'm also going to teach it at the same time, like I would in an actual classroom, um, where I read the text, but also you know, provide commentary and talk through it, um, talk through things to notice and that kind of thing on the way through. Um, we're going to start with John Updike's short story, A and P. Um, and so let's begin. All right. So A and P by John Updike is a story about, um, at, at the very basic level, about a 19 year old kid watching three girls in bathing suits walk through the A and P, which is a grocery store, um, in the 1960s. So, uh, we're hearing the story through his eyes. So, Everything we see, all the processing, everything is via um, a 19-year-old's gaze. Um, and since the three girls are the the object of his objects of his gaze for most of the story, um, we want to pay particular attention to how they're described. Um, so let's begin. In walks these three girls in nothing but bathing suits. I'm in the third checkout slot with my back to the door, so I don't see them until they're over by the bread. The one that caught my eye first was the one in the plaid green two-piece. She was a chunky kid with a good tan and a sweet, broad, soft-looking can with those two crescents of white just under it. You want to notice also that many of these words that... um that he's using like crescents of white. I mean, all of those can be like, um, even calls her rear end a can, um, are also grocery store adjacent terms too. Um, where the sun never seems to hit at the top of the backs of her legs, I stood there with my hand on a box of high ho crackers trying to remember if I rang it up or not. I ring it up again and the customer starts giving me hell. She's one of these cash register watchers, a witch of about 50 with rouge on her cheekbones and no eyebrows. And I know it made her day to trip me up. This is the 1960s version of Karen, right? Um, she'd been watching cash registers for 50 years and probably never seen a mistake before. By the time I got her feathers smoothed and her goodies into a bag, she gives me a little snort in passing. If she'd been born at the right time, they would have burned her over in Salem. By the time I get her on her way, the girls had circled around the bread and were coming back, without a push cart, back my way along the counters, in the aisle between the checkouts and the special bins. They didn't even have shoes on. There was this chunky one, you know, notice that repetition too, with the two-piece. It was bright green and the seams on the bra were still sharp and her belly was still pretty pale. You also want to keep an eye um, on the contrast between um, colors, like bright colors and stark white and what you'll see later is like gray stuff too so i guess you just got it the suit there was this one with one of those chubby berry faces the lips all bunched together under the no her nose this one and a tall one with black hair that hadn't quite frizzed right and one of those sunburns there's another one of those colors right across under the eyes and a chin that was too long you know the kind of girl other girls think is very striking and attractive but never quite makes it as they very well know which is why they like her so much and then the third one that wasn't quite so tall she was the queen. She kind of led them, the other two peeking around and making their shoulders round. She didn't look around, not this queen. She just walked straight on slowly on those long white prima donna legs. She came down a little hard on her heels, as if she didn't walk in her bare feet that much, putting down her heels and then letting the weight move along to her toes as if she were testing the floor with every step, putting a little deliberate extra action into it. You never know for sure how girls' minds work. Do you really think it's a mind in there or just a little buzz like a bee in a glass jar that's going to come back? Because I would argue that his mind is also working like a bee in a glass jar. But you got the idea she had talked the other two into coming in here with her, and now she was showing them how to do it. Walk slow and hold yourself straight. She had on a kind of a dirty pink beige maybe i don't know bathing suit with a little nubble all over it and what got me the straps were down i want you to notice too that in contrast to the other girls um, this one has several details 
like nubble all over it and dirty pink beige um, that are indicating that despite this being like the the girl that's the head of like the queen he calls her um, that her bathing suit is much older like a little nubble come, those little pills that go on um, bathing suits and clothes when you've washed them a whole bunch of times um, that's what he's talking about they were off her shoulders looped loose around the cool tops of her arms, and I guess as a result the suit had slipped a little on her, so all around the top of the cloth there was this shining rim. If it hadn't been there, you wouldn't have known there could have been anything wider than those shoulders. With the straps pushed off, there was nothing between the top of the suit and the top of her head except just her, this clean, bare plane of the top of her chest down from the shoulder bones like a dented sheet of metal tilted in the light. I mean, it was more than pretty. She had sort of oaky hair that the sun and salt had bleached, done up in a bun that was unraveling, and kind of a prim face. Walking into the A&P with your straps down, I suppose it's the only kind of face you can have. She held her head so high her neck, coming up out of those white shoulders, looked kind of stretched, but I didn't mind. The longer her neck was, the more of her there was. You also need to pay attention in these two paragraphs right here that he says she's pretty like the word like he it was more than pretty right and he uses that phrase exactly um but the words he uses to describe her are not traditionally feminine um words um most words that you would you see historically in literature to describe the female form um reference curves somehow right um but what he use he uses like shining rim um let's see he clean bare plane at the top of her chest um down from the shoulders like a dented sheet of metal tilted in the light like that and even use it, even the way he describes her hair as oaky that's a tree right so it's and and to use the word prim also is not um a compliment usually prim and um uh, has the connotation of being stuck up. Um, so the words he's using to describe her, despite the fact that he is saying she's pretty, um, the words he's using to describe her are not words you would traditionally use for someone, a, a female form that you would find attractive, like in literature, in literature speaking. She must have felt in the corner of her eye, me and over my shoulder, Stokesy in the second, second slot watching, but she didn't tip, not this queen. I noticed that repetition, too. She kept her eyes moving across the racks and stopped and turned so slow it made my stomach rub against the inside of my apron and buzz to the other two who kind of huddled against her for relief. There's the buzz from the bees, too, right? Um, and then they all... They all three of them went up the cat and dog food, breakfast, cereal, macaroni, rice, raisin, seasoning, spread, spaghetti, soft drinks, crackers, and cookies aisle. That's a bee buzzing line if I ever saw one, right? That's, that's going everywhere. And when you have lists like that with that kind of punctuation, it kind of speeds up. Um, it, it accelerates. So it it's a way that the language echoes or the form of the line echoes the content, like his brain and his body are speeding up, um, his heart's beating faster because of these girls there. Um, from the third slot, I looked straight up this aisle to the meat counter, and I watched them all the way. The fat one with the tan sort of fumbled with the cookies, but on second thought, she put the package back. The sheep pushing their carts down the aisle. The girls were walking against the usual traffic, not that we have one-way signs or anything. We're pretty hilarious. You notice in that sentence too that the 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 his thoughts go in like four different directions too in parenthetical phrases and stuff. You could see them when Queenie's white shoulders dawned on them, kind of jerk or hop or hiccup, but their eyes snapped back to their own baskets and on they pushed. I bet you could set off dynamite in an A and P, and the people would by and large keep reaching and checking oatmeal off their lists and muttering, "Let me see, there was a third thing. Begin with A. Asparagus? No. Yeah. Yes, applesauce, or whatever it is they do mutter. But there was no doubt this jiggled them. I've always loved that word um, there." the jiggled because it's um obviously referencing um the bodies right but it's also 
um, in contrast to the clean bare plane of metal and dented sheet of metal and stuff like that, right? So, anyway, a few house slaves and pin curlers even looked around after pushing their carts past to make sure what they had seen was correct. You know, it's one thing to have a girl in a bathing suit down on the beach, where what with the glare, nobody can look at each other much anyway. And another thing, in the cool of the A&P under the fluorescent lights, against all those stacked packages, with our feet paddling along naked over our checkerboard green and cream rubber tile floor. He even uses the word naked there, right? He's talking about her feet, but still. Oh, Daddy, Stokesy said beside me, I feel so faint. Darling, I said, hold me tight. Stokesy's married, with two babies chalked up on his fuselage already, but as far as I can tell, that's the only difference. He's 22, and I was 19 this April. Is it done? he asks, the responsible married man finding his voice. I forgot to say he thinks he's going to be manager some sunny day, maybe in 1990. That would be 30 years from when the story's been written. Um, when it's called the Great Alexandrov and Petrushki Tea Company or something. They think the, or the joke is that the communists are going to take over the United States by then. What he meant was, our town is five miles from a beach with a big summer colony out on the point, but we're right in the middle of town, and the women generally put on a shirt or shorts or something before they get out of the car into the street. And anyway, these are usually women with six children and varicose veins mapping their legs, and nobody, including them, could care less. As I say, we're right in the middle of town, and if you stand at our front doors, you can see two banks and the Congregational Church and the newspaper store and three real estate offices and about 27 old freeloaders tearing up Central Street because the sewer broke again. It's not as if we're on the Cape. We're north of Boston, and there's people in this town haven't seen the ocean for 20 years. It also echoes back um, to... Him saying they would have burned her over, burned the Karen, I'm using quote fingers here, over in Salem. Um, Salem would have been pretty close to where Boston, um, modern day Boston is too. Um, he's talking about the witch trials obviously then. But um, I want you to also pay attention as we go through this to, to the listing. Um, and you, you see it in the cat and dog food breakfast cereal, macaroni, rice, raisins, etc. But um, he has lots of sentences Updike does that seem to go on and on and on and on and that kind of mirrors how this kid's brain is working it's just going faster and faster and faster and faster the girls had reached the meat counter and were asking McMahon something he pointed and they pointed and they shuffled out of sight behind a pyramid of diet delight peaches all that was left for us to see was old McMahon patting his mouth and looking after them, sizing up their joints. Poor kids. I began to feel sorry for them. They couldn't help it. It's, um, of course, ironic that they're all, that Stokesy and he are sizing up their joints, so to speak, too. Um, it's, um, it's also, he also uses sizing up their joints. That's another one of those grocery things, right? Um, because the person who's doing it's a butcher. Now here comes the sad part of the story. At least my family says it's sad, but I don't think it's so sad myself. The store is pretty empty, it being Thursday afternoon, so there was nothing much to do except lean on the register and wait for the girls to show up again. The whole store was like a pinball machine, and I didn't know which tunnel they'd come out of. After a while, they come around out of the far aisle, around the light bulbs, records at discount of the Caribbean Six or Tony Martin Sings or some such gunk that you wonder what they waste the wax on, six packs of candy bars and plastic toys done up in cellophane that fall apart when a kid looks at them anyway. Around they come, Queenie still leading the way and holding a little gray jar in her hands. Slots three through seven are unmanned, and I could see her wondering between Stokes and me, but Stokesy, with his usual luck, draws an old party in a baggy gray pants who stumbles up with four giant cans of pineapple juice. What do these bums do with all that pineapple juice? I've often asked myself. So the girls come to me. Queenie puts down the jar, and I take it into my fingers icy cold. Kingfish, fancy herring snacks, and pure sour cream. That's another one of those silver and white things, right? The... Um, sour cream being white and the fish being silver. Um, now her hands are empty, not a ring or bracelet, bare as God made them, and I wonder where the money's coming from. Still, with that prim look, she lifts a folded dollar bill out of the hollow at the center of her nubbled pink top. The jar went heavy in my hand. Really, I thought that was so cute. 
Then everybody's luck begins to run out. Langle comes in from haggling with a truck full of cabbages on the lot and is about to scuttle into that door marked manager behind which he hides all day when the girls touch his eye. Lingle's pretty dreary, teaches Sunday school and the rest, but he doesn't miss that much. He comes over and said, Girls, this isn't the beach. Queenie blushes, and may, though maybe it's just a brush of sunburn I was noticing for the first time now that she was so close. My mother asked me to pick up a jar of herring snacks. Her voice kind of startled me, the way voices do when you see the people first, coming out so flat and dumb, and yet kind of tony too, the way it ticked over pick up and snack. All right, so this part right here, too, is another one of those um, details where he's describing her as not attractive at all, right? Um, he calls her voice flat and dumb. I mean, you would normally, I mean, traditionally in literary, when you're describing an attractive woman's voice, it's musical somehow or goes up and down or flutters around or whatever, right? Um, he says it's flat and dumb and Tony is kind of like masculine, Ish. So it's the opposite of all of those things you would normally use to um, describe uh, a woman who you find attractive's voice. Rem remember, this is from a from the perspective of a nineteen year old boy um, who generally ha gen who generally have um, one single thing on their minds, right? All of a sudden, I slid right down her voice into the living room. Her father and the other men were standing around in ice cream coats and bow ties and the women were in sandals picking up herring snacks on toothpicks off a big glass plate and they were all holding drinks the color of water with olives and sprigs of mint in them. That's a Gatsby party, right? I mean, that's the kind of party you would see in Gatsby. This is what, she's, what he's describing. Um, it's what he's imagining um, what the girl's parents want the, um, want the herring snacks for. Um, that obviously contrasts with um, her wearing an old bathing suit um, in public like this. And maybe they don't have as much money as he is imagining they do. When my parents have somebody over, they'll get lemonade. And if it's a real racy affair, Schlitz and tall glasses, that's like 40 beer. This is like cheap beer. Um, tall glasses with they'll do it every time cartoons stenciled on. That's all right, Lingle said, but this isn't the beach. His repeating this struck me as funny, as if it had just occurred to him, and he had been thinking all these years the A&P was a great big dune and he was the head lifeguard. He didn't like my smiling. As I say, he doesn't miss much, but he concentrates on giving the girls that sad Sunday school superintendent stare. I love all those S's. Notice that. Queenie's blush is no sunburn now, and the plump one in plaid that I liked better from the back. Ooh, he just called her ugly, too. Ugh. That's tacky. Um, a really sweet can pipes up. We weren't doing any shopping. We just came in for the one thing. That makes no difference, Lingle tells her, and I could see from the way his eyes went that he hadn't noticed she was wearing a two-piece before. We want you decently dressed when you come in here. We are decent, Queenie says suddenly, her lower lip pushing, getting sore now that she remembers her place, a place from which the crowd that runs the A&P must look pretty crummy. Fancy herring snacks flashed in her very blue eyes. That's the, other than her bathing suit, the first like bright color um, that has been associated with her, right? I mean, all of the other ones, even the bathing suit is like a dull, um, dingy color. Girls, I don't want to argue with you. After this, come in here with your shoulders covered. It's our policy. He turns his back. That's policy for you. Policy is what the kingpins want. What others want is juvenile delinquency. All this while, the customers have been showing up with their carts, but you know, sheep, seeing a scene, they had all bunched up on Stokes, who shook up in a paper bag as gently as peeling a peach, not wanting to miss a word. I could feel in the silence everybody getting nervous, most of all Langle, who asked me, Sammy? Have you rung up their purchase? I thought and said, no. But it wasn't about that I was thinking. I go through the punches, four, nine, gross total. It's more complicated than you think, and after you do it often enough, it begins to make a little song that you hear words to. In my case, hello, bing, there, you gong, happy people, splat. The splat being the drawer flying out. I increase the bill tenderly as you may imagine, it just having come from between the two smoothest scoops of vanilla I had ever known were there. That's another one of those um, really super white things too, right? 
one of those white contrasts um, like the color. Um, and pass a half and a penny into her narrow pink palm. There's another bright color that's associated with her now. Like It seems like after they had this interaction, she's starting to come alive some ways. I mean, it's e even in the blushing in her cheeks. Um, you have, she's not a caricature or a figure like in a story far away. She is a real live person with feelings and emotions and stuff, blood in her veins. Um, this is that's also the first time where is it um, um the where her body is scoop body is described as scoops of vanilla that's the first time her body has been described as anything um that is more traditionally feminine and nestled the herrings in a bag and twist its neck and hand it over all the time thinking the girls and who'd blame them are in a hurry to get out, so I say I quit to lingle quick enough for them to hear, hoping they'll stop and watch me, their unsuspected hero. They keep right on going into the electric eye. The door flies open and they flicker across the lot to their car, queenie and plaid and big tall goony goony, not that his raw material she was so bad, leaving me with lingle and a kink in his eyebrow. Did you say something, Sammy? I said I quit. I thought you did. You didn't have to embarrass them. It was they that were embarrassing us, who were embarrassing us. I started to say something that came out, fiddle to do. It's a saying of my grandmother's, and I know she would have been pleased. I love that so much, that this 19-year-old kid is saying fiddle de do as when he's trying to be like macho and tough and um, stand up for these girls. He's, it, it comes out as um, this grandmama phrase. He even says it was his grandmother's phrase. I don't think you know what you're saying, Lingle said. I know you don't, but I do, I said. I pull the bow at the back of my apron and start shrugging it off my shoulders. A couple customers that had been heading for my slot began to knock each against each other like scared pigs in a chute. Lingle sighs and begins to look very patient and old and gray. He's been a friend of my parents for years. Sammy, you don't want to do this to your mom and dad, he tells me. It's true, I don't. But it seems to me that once you begin a gesture, it's fatal not to go through with it. It's interesting that he uses the word fatal. I mean, that means it'll kill you, right? Um, and there's lots of implications in this story but about um, what his future holds. He'll talk about that in a second. I fold the apron, Sammy stitched in red on the pocket, and put it on the counter and drop the bow tie on top of it. The bow tie is theirs, if you've ever wondered. You'll feel this for the rest of your life, Lingle says, and I know that's true too, but remembering how he made the pretty girl blush makes me so scrunchy inside, I punch the no-sale tab, and the machine whirs peep and the drawer splats out. One advantage to the scene taking place in summer, I can follow this up with a clean exit. There's no fumbling around getting your coat and galoshes. I just saunter into the electric eye in my white shirt that my mother ironed the night before, and the door heaves itself open, and outside the sunshine is skating around on the asphalt. I want you to notice also this right here is all one sentence, um, and which makes sense because it is sped up, right? When he, you can definitely feel like his his adrenaline coursing through his body on in those lines. I look around for my girls. Notice he calls them my right, my girls, um, but they're gone. Of course, there wasn't anybody but some young married screaming with her children about some candy they didn't get by the door of a powder blue Falcon station wagon. That's another bright color too, right? It'll be important in a second. Looking back in the big windows over the bags of peat moss and aluminum lawn furniture stacked on the pavement, I could see Lingle in my place in the slot, checking the sheep through. His face was dark gray and his back stiff, as if he just had an injection of iron. And my stomach kind of fell as I felt how hard the world was going to be to me hereafter. Right, so you have... At the very end, you have these girls, um, and even a station wagon outside too, who are brightly colored. Like he, and literally, what has happened is the character, the narrator, has walked out of the store into the sunshine, into the bright light of day. Right, and he looks back behind him and sees um, his boss. Um, 
he uses lots of words that are gray, um, even aluminum lawn furniture is too. Um, checking sheep through his face was dark gray and his back was stiff an injection of iron. So like all of those are like dark and gray. It's like he's looking back over his shoulder and he's watching like a black and white TV behind him. Um, it's pretty obvious that this is, he, he's seeing what his future could have been. Um, earlier, um, he says, um, it says like, um, where the, his boss says, um, where does it say you'll feel this for the rest of your life, right? Um, and he means that his boss means that as a bad thing, right? But I don't think he thinks of it as a bad thing. He even says earlier, let me go back and find it. Um, um, here comes the sad part of the story. At least my family says it's sad, but I don't think it's so sad myself. Um, so he's seeing it, seeing he, he he's telling this story like later in his life about something that happened to him when he was younger, but he doesn't see it as a negative thing. So we're assuming he's gone on to do something, maybe not something greater and better, but certainly not working in a grocery store when he's 50. So yeah, it's a fascinating story. Um, I hope the commentary has helped. Um, I'll put in a link in the description below, um, a link to our other channel, which, which has a video of me just reading the story straight through without the commentary as well, um, if that would be more to your um, taste and what you're here trying to find. But um, if you're writing an essay on this or doing other kinds of um, analysis, I hope those give you the comments or not too distracting and give you somewhere to kind of um, get going with. Um, so. Yeah. Take care of yourselves. Um, this is obviously a production of Thomas and Morris Instruction and the creators, myself and my wife would love it if you would like and share and subscribe and comment to help us goose the YouTube algorithm. So thanks for your support. See you next time.